Good morning. Welcome to today's episode of The View. I'm Asia Hauser and I'm in Seattle, Washington. And we are so excited today. We will be talking about the Harper Watkins Symposium. No, Harper Jordan. Harper Jordan. I knew I was going to screw that up with Executive Director of Black Lives of UU, Lena Gardner. So first we will start with, and Lena, you are more than welcome to be part of our UU Roundup. Uh, Chris, Chris, how are you? You are not I'm, on this coast. <laughs> I'm not on that early ass coast. Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Christina Rivera. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where we um, just had overnight a couple of uh, free for, I don't know, inches of snow, which closed our schools, power lines down, all that kind of fun stuff. And I am just over this winter. I really am. I am just over it, which doesn't mean anything other than I'm sure there's more snow coming our way. <laughs> Margaret, where are you coming to us from? I am coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. And, you know, we have not had much snow, but it seems like every time it snows, we get icy snow, which was what happened yesterday. So, and then I had a very, very early doctor's appointment this morning, 645. So trying to get out there and, yeah, I've never heard of such a thing, but that's what this doctor does. So trying to get out there, scraping my car. So that was something. Well, I have to say though, I don't really mind the cold. I know, I know you're all tired of it, but I don't mind it. We haven't had much of it this year. So um, as you know, we'll be checking for your questions and comments on Facebook and we'll put on Twitter and all that good stuff. So. Um, that's it for me. I like that you put snow in quotes, like yeah. it's real. That was awesome. <laughs> our our snow's almost melted. I will say, as much as I was whining on Facebook, uh, it's literally almost gone in my entire. I mean, there's maybe one, that one dirty clump is there, and that's <laughs> it. <clears throat> Lena, hi, hello. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm coming. Where to are you? you? I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I have to say, so you are, you are killing me with that snowpocalypse. I was like, you should just sit all the way down. Cause you got nothing on us. You got nothing. I'm up here shoveling off my roof, which I didn't even know was a thing, but it's a totally a thing that you have to do if your roof is not well insulated, which I'm learning mine isn't. So, you know, and then yesterday we got a historic snowfall as well. Um, that is the biggest snowfall in February that Minnesota has ever received in the month of February. And so we're just digging up from that. And it was something like, I think nine inches or something all day. It was just snow, snow. But I will say the one, the one saving grace is that it is the beautiful, fluffy, sparkly snow, which I really like. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's also easier to shovel because it's lighter and it doesn't have all of the water when you get the, the more moisture snow. Shoveling that is like, it's a big workout. So yes, coming to you from beautiful snowy Minneapolis. Um, roads are a little bit better today because the snow has stopped and hopefully we won't have another round coming for a little while because I, I do, my cats need some food. I need to get myself to the grocery store. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, and I'm so happy to be here. So thank you for having me. Well, we're going to go into we're going to go into our UU roundup and talk about what's going on. Chris, what do you, what do you have? What's on the docket? Um, so I would love to give a shout out for the UUA Distinguished Service Award. Um, nominations are right now open for that. And um, having served on the committee um, that um, kind of vets all of the applications and nominations for that and then um, selects a recipient, um, I can't stress how important it is to really um, to start expanding our view of what this a Distinguished Service Award is and could be. And I would love to have to see more nominations um, from folks from UUs of marginalized identities. Um, for, for a really long time, um, that award has been really kind of captured in just one way. And I'd love to see us really start breaking out of that and looking at what does Distinguished Service Award look like for somebody in their 20s? Um, you know, what does it look like for a youth or young adult of color? Like what, why do we automatically equate length um, with, you know, with 
needing to be recognized. So if you know um, a youth, young adult of color or youth, young adult from marginalized identity, please, please, please consider nominating them. That's a, that's a great point that you don't need to have served for 60 years to have impact. So um, we have quite a few folks in all ages, especially who are working hard in this faith, who have hold a marginalized identity. So that's a great point. And the Angus McLean Award for Excellence in Religious Education, also the nominations are um, being uh, sought, solicited, yeah. that's the yeah. word. <laughs> it's early, I don't know words yet. So uh, where do people go, uh, Christina, Chris, the UUA website? How do you can people, go to um, UUA.org for both of those and then just do a search for Distinguished Service Award or McLean um, Award. And I, I would just like to note that we have the current holder of the McLean um, Award winner right here on The View. Asia Hauser was the recipient of that. And I, I, I fully expect to see you out there you know, with the crown and the sun. I have to give up my sash. So it's going to be like a, a hand. So, you asked me, is there a sash? I made one. So look, listen. Yes. <laughs> I'm owning it. No, I have this ginormous award. In my, and when we got it, it's beautiful. And my daughter goes, did you get another master's? I said, how would I do that without telling you? I don't understand. Like, how would it? Ha yeah, my family's reaction was very funny. Like, wow, mom, that's awesome. And big. <laughs> it is big. We, we, we go big on those. Or we go home, right? Anything yeah. else? Lena, Margot, you have anything? No, I I can't think of anything um, right now. So Lena? So the other one um, I would mention is um, our very own Unitarian Universalist, uh, Leslie Mack, was featured in Essence Magazine, which was huge. Um, everybody should flip on over there to the website and take a look at it. It was a great, um, I really liked the take on, you know, what is behind activism for activists. And I love that Leslie named her faith, you know, as such an important part of the work that she does um, and in, in that realm of how she came to it. And I, I, like, I loved some of the backstory that I didn't know about Leslie. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and it kind of sparked, um, a little bit of a discussion later on in the week about the inappropriateness of white women doing um, paid work around intersectionality. And um, that was um, kind of a, a couple of Facebook posts and threads that went on um, later on, I, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, um, just talking about, you know, what does it mean um, to not have that as the way you go through life, um, but be asked to talk on that and and um, give workshops and be paid to do work that is not part of, uh, for white women, part of their um, lived experience. Um, so that was, that was really um, interesting to see, particularly, you know, through a Unitarian Universalist framework where we do are, are trying to get people to understand intersectionality. Um, and, you know, as often happens, white folks, um, when we're trying to get them to understand something and they think they understand it, then they think it's theirs um, to take it and, and do with what they want. Um, so just a, you know, a reminder for folks that, that not everything is yours to do something with that you think, um, you know, is appropriate. Uh, you really need to, to check yourself and, and check in and see, you know, where that came from, because like Leslie said, there are, there's a black woman who came up with that and is doing work on it. And it would be, you know, wonderful to support, um, to come and do your workshop. Um, or your symposium or whatever. Yes, I just want to echo that and affirm that. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 a thousand times yes. Um, and also, uh, um, Chris, you had posted <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago something about, is it yoga or meditations on um, white white supremacy, white something, and it was a white woman, you, you had posted essentially the same thing. And it was something not, uh, I think it was just your area, it wasn't necessarily UU, but it was another per white woman making money off of 
Yeah, we, I, yeah, I get, can you say you more know, about that? I get times, you know, uh, folks send me things to amplify and say, you know, we're doing this workshop and it, it's meditation. It was for white people to meditate and to, um, to, you know, kind of come to grips with their internal race, internalized racism um, and to, um, you know, really dive into how racism, how they're perpetuating racism and, and do meditative work around that, <clears throat> contemplative work around that, which is awesome. And my question always is, if there's a fee involved in this, which there was, um, how is that money then going to be supporting women of color? Um, because if it's just an exercise in contemplating, you know, your own internalized racism and there's money being um, generated from this, then you are not making that, that, that work is to me not worthwhile. And because you're not actually doing the work right? You're doing the work to look at yourself, but you're not doing work to actively change um, the experience, lived experience and lived lives of women of color, Black women in particular. Um, and there are so many ways that that money um, can be redirected to, to folks. Um, so that's really kind of one of my criteria is if there's a fee involved in it, who's benefiting from that fee? Um, and I'm happy to amplify it if that is going to, you know, um, queer women, trans women, women of color, you know, all of that kind of thing. But if it's just an exercise and kind of navel gazing, um, I'm not here for it. Navel gazing that, that white people are profiting off of. So I, I appreciate the framing that it's not that you can't, in fact, that you are obligated to do this work and not make money off of it and support directly folks with target identities, black women, black trans women, and there's ways to do that. So thank you. Um, Speaking but, of which, oh, oh, I, just, I just wanted to add in, by the way, to that point, the scholar who came up with the idea of intersectionality, her name was Kimberly Crenshaw. And, you know, she's, you can find her on Facebook, you can find her on Twitter. Um, there's lots of ways you can hire her to come and talk about intersectionality um, and what the concept is and how it operates. Um, and so just want to put that in there and say her name. Yeah, she's still alive and well. She she did that she's TED talk so. on intersectionality, and and the UUs can can bring her. Oh darn, maybe a wear lecture one year, or at this uh, at a local conference that UUs are sponsoring. Speaking of conferences, Black Lives of UU is sponsoring the Harper Jordan Symposium. I think I was the first one to register. I just want to. <laughs> sure. you, you can verify that. <laughs> Yes, yes, you were, um, and we're so glad and thankful for it. Um, so yeah, I am here to talk about the Harper Jordan Memorial Symposium. The symposium is going to take place in St. Paul, Minnesota in uh, October, um, late October, so October 30th through November 2nd. So that's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, we'll be kicking things off in the evening. So hopefully people will have some time to travel during the day. We'll start off with a reception. Uh, we'll have programming on Thursday and Friday and we'll end with a worship on Saturday morning and then everybody will be able to get back home in time for services wherever they are um, on Sunday morning. We're really thrilled about this. Um, I will mention that part of the reason we did this is because is uh, well, there's a multitude of reasons, but some of the main reasons has to do with uh, people really in survey in the blue survey that we took last year at the convening and basically um, sort of ongoing discussions about what it means to be a black Unitarian Universalist. What does that theologically mean? Um, and also understanding our roots in the faith. Uh, there's a way in which Unitarian Universalism, the contributions of particularly Black uh, Americans, Black Unitarian Universalists have been uh, hidden, have been erased from the narrative. And so part of what we're hoping to do with this is to bring that to light. We're also hoping to provide a space for people to really dive deep into what it means to be a Black Unitarian Universalist um, and theologically what that means. Um, 
so towards that end, I mean, even in the naming of the symposium, um, you know, we we picked two uh, people who are, I think, kind of well known, but not really. Um, so Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, and I'll just encourage you to go Google her, find out and learn about her. Um, and then Reverend Joseph Jordan, um, also just encourage you to Google him and find out about who he was. Both of them were, you know, Black Unitarian Universalists who had significant contributions to our faith. Um, and people need to know about them because it was really important. So that's, um, yeah, so that's coming in this fall. Um, and it is open to everyone. We want people to know that it's open to everyone. Um, we are prioritizing, uh, you know, black folks, indigenous folks and people of color. So we do have sort of a cap on uh, white folks that are can register. However, we just are encouraging people to register. Um, go ahead and register and we'll let you know um, once we've hit that cap um, and we'll go from there. So yeah, I, I'm, we're really excited about it. We're putting a ton of you know thought into it. The other sort of main driving force is that um, we really hope to produce out of this a Black EU lectionary that people can really work from throughout the church year. Um, and so we're really looking forward to building that out of this. Um, there, and it's already, you know, plans are already underway to do that. So it's going to be a really good time. I'm, I'm not going to be mentioning the names of people yet that we're hoping will come just because we're still waiting on final confirmations. And that never goes well when you're like, this person might come and then they, they can't. And then somebody's like, but you said they were. So we're just not saying anything until we get final confirmations from people. Um, and as you can imagine, some of these folks are very, um, you know, very busy, very in high in high need around the country so people are trying to fit it into their schedules but i can tell you this that there is a lot of excitement about it there's a lot of um just yeah anticipation looking forward to it we're going to have opportunities for people there to break out into small groups and have discussions with each other um, you know, we are also right now, um, Dr. Takia Amin, Reverend Michael Slack, and Reverend, Lee Kim Kimberly, Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson um, are all at the Proctor Conference um, in Alabama right now um, with a lot of other of their Black, um, you know, ministerial colleagues and um, reaching out. So, uh, and connecting with people. So I can say that we're really excited for it. It's going to be a really amazing thing. I'm also excited to have people in, um, you know, the Minneapolis St. Paul area. Um, and part of why we did that uh, was because, you know, it's when you get out on the coast of things, if you have people coming from the other side of the coast, it's really hard. The time changes different for people. We're also looking at costs. It's always more expensive to do things on the coast. Um, and so, we thought, why not, why not do it here? I also want to give a shout out to the UU community here in Minneapolis, um, in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, because they have played a big part in helping birth blue into the world. Um, and I think that's, you know, just an important thing to note and acknowledge. Um, and I am personally really grateful for that. So that's part of why we're doing uh, the the worship at Unity Church Unitarian in St. Paul, and we're really looking forward to it. So I'll stop there because I feel like I'm just going on and on, but it's really exciting. I'm super excited for it too. And and I'm I was really thrilled that you all actually you mentioned having it, you know, St. Paul, Minneapolis area. And I feel like there's so much happening in, in your area that um, particularly folks from the coast see and just never have an opportunity to experience um, and to just you know sometimes putting a, a being in a place and being being able to experience the the spirit and the you know nature of that place really helps at least for me in be able to take that in and to be like oh okay now now i kind of even get it even more so i'm i'm thrilled that it's, it's being held there <laughs> um can you talk a little bit about, um, so I was, you know, I went on to register, very excited. Um, and I, I uh, 
really like going to conferences where it's really thoughtful from jump, like from the registration part of um, interacting with a conference. And um, I was really struck by a couple of things. Um, the price point for both registration and for the um, hotel, um, you know, from a conference standpoint is really super reasonable. Um, and then I, I loved how you had people identify, you know, um, their race and ethnicity. Um, and it was different. And now I can't exactly remember, but I think there were like three different choices. Um, and it wasn't like you have to, you know, pick from 15 different choices and, you know, kind of parse your identity out. Um, and I just felt like that was something really thoughtful. So I don't know if you can maybe speak to how you all, you know, looked at it holistically. Absolutely, I can talk about that. I think, um, you know, since our origination, we have sought to be a, a spiritual home for Black Unitarian Universalists and recognizing that that means in this context of, you know, America, that means that a lot of our folks are facing the effects of structural oppression um, and, um, and, a, and, and a historical inheritance of that. So what you have to do um, from that standpoint is really look at how to mitigate that um, and what are the things you can do to mitigate that. And I really have to credit um, Leslie Mack for this, um, bringing her experience from organizing in the movement for Black Lives um, to really coming in with that framework of how do we mitigate these effects to ensure that the people we say we are serving that this is accessible to them. So even from the very beginning, when we started the convening, when we had our convening in New Orleans, um, you know, most people don't know when we crunched the numbers after that, about 76% of the people had significant financial aid. The majority of those had all of their um, housing, food and travel covered um, in full. And so, you know, that's what it looks like and that's what it means to do that. And there was no registration cost for that convening, right? Um, and so, you know, we had less money available when we did the revival. Um, and so we did by design keep that smaller because we knew we, we just had less money available to help with people getting there. And so this time around, um, you know, once again, we just sort of thought about, um, and, you know, we just thought about, uh, yeah, how do we make an investment in getting people, you know, here or, or making it affordable? What can we do? So that looks like a sliding scale fee for registration, um, including an option of, you know, I just, I can't pay anything, um, which is really real for some people. Because the other thing that we recognize is um, for a lot of folks too, this is taking time off work, right? So you would be missing, you know, that income. Um, and so, we're really trying to figure out ways to do that. I don't think it's perfect by any means yet, but we keep trying to make it better. So, you know, one of the things that was really important to me that we did this time around was um, I'm personally at a frustration point with this umbrella term people of color because I'm watching the ways in which it invisibilizes the particular struggles of black people in this country and the particular history of indigenous people in this in this country um, and in some terms global globally right um, and so you know and that's not to say that other people of, co uh, of color who immigrate here don't face different structural inequities because they certainly do uh, however there is a very particular um, you know socio and political and historical experience that I feel like we can't just sweep under the rug that is the legacy of black folks and indigenous folks. Um, so when we created this registration, I really wanted to pull that out um, and give people an opportunity to understand that there is something different. Um, and we need to acknowledge that, you know, when we're coming into uh, Minnesota and we're coming into St. Paul, um, you know, most people don't know that I think there, the total is something like 23 sovereign Indian nations here in the state of Minnesota and we will, you know, we will be on um, native land in my estimation when we're on the banks of um, the Mississippi and in St. Paul. And so, 
really trying to hone in on that um, and figure that out and honor that legacy and bring life to it, I feel like is part of the work too. So that's, you know, so accessibility, understanding, you know, and placing ourselves in, I think a more truer narrative of the, his, the history of this country is really important and part of what we're trying to do um, with that to really pull those things out. Um, so yeah, so we definitely um, attempt to do that in everything we do. So I think this particular uh, gathering, one thing we, we recognize too is that we're not feeding people as much as we have in the past. Um, however, we just, I just can't underscore enough, like if you really want to be here and money is a huge barrier, just let us know um, because we have different ways that we can help support people, um, at, including, uh, you know, offering helping um, people fundraise from their congregations and other things. The one thing we've seen is that there are a lot of white UU churches that are, um, you know, have a desire to help people. Um, and, you know, and then there's things that come with navigating that desire, right? It's, um, and so how do we help people navigate these systems? People often wanna see like a written out plan and all of these things. And so that's where we can really come in and help with the churches understand that if you wanna give, you, you can just give. And also, um, you know, there's no then coming back and demanding that that person give you a report back of their experience or, you know, you're not entitled to that. Um, either. And so how do we, and we've, and that comes out of experience. We've had people where that has happened for our gatherings before. Um, and, and, you know, and we'll just be, all, all I can say is we'll be there to help support you and saying no. And, you know, and helping people recognize that that's a pattern of white supremacy. And that if we're going to be working at dismantling white supremacy within our faith, um, it happens in these little moments, as well as, you know, bigger moments, but certainly, um, most importantly in these little moments. And I really want to um, just give um, Dero uh, Farrar some, some love because he just posted on Facebook a post about, hey, like a lot of UU churches and congregations are, are like, we really want to be a multicultural church. And like, you know, one, let's question, like, is that a good end in and of itself? And then secondly, he was like, how about treating the people of color, Black folks and Indigenous folks you had there how about treating them better? How about we start there? Um, and I just can't underscore the importance of that enough. How about you start there? The people who are, are already there in your doors um, are not being treated well. And we, we know that. Um, certainly, um, you know, people are here because theologically they're Unitarian Universalists. And this is something we hear time and time again in blue spaces. Um, that you know they're just not treated well and so how can we start to see treating the people who are here already uh better and in a more loving way uh, i think that's a good place to start so yeah you know, so, i also really appreciate the modeling blue is doing with all of this it's like this is how you do it because there's always been this big question mark over folks' head like, well, yeah, you know, kind of shrugging of the shoulders. I'm like, no, you can fix. So your modeling of, of from kind of soup to nuts has been extraordinary. And the, um, the uh, webinar that you did, it wasn't a webinar, it was a panel. What just you're, you're create, you're centering the black experience online far and wide and making it accessible. And as Chris said, even registration, I was also really impressed with um, so, so that modeling is kind of speaking to DeRoe's point is it's out there how to do it. Take care of the folks you already have and, and ask how to do this. Don't pretend it hasn't been done. Take the lead, kind of going circling back to what we started with. Take the lead of, of Black women, of, of Indigenous women. Take the lead of people, of, you know, people who've been doing this. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think it's so important that the point that you made of, you know, treating the folks that we have, well, you use, you know, Black you use, you use of color, Indigenous you use, um, well, that we already have in our congregations. Um, finding Our Way Home, which is the religious, the gathering for religious professionals of color is coming up in just about a month. And it, I always notice that in the, the two months leading up to Finding Our Way Home, there's a huge uptick in 
religious professionals of color just hurting and being hurt and just expressing like, you know, they're, they're almost at the, their edge, you know, they've, they've taken as much as they can take and they're just hanging on for finding our way home um, because it's the one time of year that they'll be able to, you know, gather with other religious professionals of color in order to, you know, lay that down, lay the, down those burdens and, and be refilled. Um, but we're, we're doing that from each other and we're doing it in a way that, um, you know, like you said, that, that sometimes, you know, we have expectations from our congregations of the report back, you know, um, because, you know, maybe a congregation, um, you know, sponsors that through your professional development fees and feels like, you know, they have some kind of vested interest in that. Um, and I think it's really important to note that, that that in itself is white supremacy culture in action. Um, when I was on the UUA board and, and we were trying to, you know, give away scholarships for folks to go to um, General Assembly, um, there was always a desire to make sure that people reported back in as to, you know, what their experience was. And I'm like, you know what, if you want to, you know, say that that's important and you want to hear from people and get feedback, that's fine. But a requirement is a completely other and different thing. And um, that's just, you know, it's just not okay. Um, so, and and to your to your other point about um, and, uh, uh, direct giving, like just give those funds. You know, people will know what to do with them. People will use them in a way <laughs> that, that benefits all of us. And you can just trust that. Like, you know, it's going to be okay uh, that, that this, we know that direct giving actually helps people in a way that is more concrete and more important to people than any other type of giving that we can do. So, you know, try and, try and uh, loosen those reins a little bit and, and figure out that, that, you know, you don't get a report back, you don't get a receipt back, it's going to be all right. Yeah, I wanted to uh, lift up a couple of posts from Facebook uh, that you may wish to speak to. Gary Simpson uh, noted that I've wondered about the term people of color, which you spoke about, Lena. Many different identities and histories of groups included in the broad term people of color. And Janine Jelsinger says this is the most one. Oh, this is the most wonderful, oh, my little thing here isn't moving. If somebody else can read on, I would appreciate that. This is the most wonderful response to the quote unquote, we need more diversity cry in congregation. Start with how you treat folks already here. And uh, thank you. And Kiana Perkins has a question for you, Christina. She asked, Christina, can we get more information on finding our way home? I don't. I can post a link to it too. Yeah, we'll definitely post a link. Registration for this Finding Our Way Home, I believe, is already closed. Um, but it is, but I can send you, I can help you out, Kiana. I was just in email contact with them for somebody else here. So yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, it's on the uua.org website. You can Google Finding Our Way Home and um, uh, not Google, but search for <laughs> finding our way home. <laughs> Google it too, um, and it'll take you right there. But yeah, it's it's super important. I was a religious professional for several years and didn't know about finding our way home um, because we just don't track religious professionals of color at all. Um, and so it wasn't until I saw a colleague at a, a collegial gathering and he said, so I'll see you next week in such and such, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? So finding our way home, I'm like, yeah, still don't know what you're talking about. Um, and, you know, so he connected me. Uh, but it's it's super important. And I will put a plug out that next week, um, I will again be soliciting donations from folks. Again, direct giving donations. Um, for religious professionals of color who are going to Finding Our Way Home that need extra funds. Um, not everything at Finding Our Way Home is covered. There are meals, 
There are folks that, as Lena said, miss work in order to go to Finding Our Way Home. So last year, I think I collected a couple thousand dollars and was able to fund people's meals. I was able to fund um, some seminarians, um, um, loss in, they were doing, you know, circuit preaching. And so they weren't going to be able to do, you know, preaching that weekend. So I was able to reimburse for some of that. We reimbursed um, some um, transportation, you know, taxiing and that kind of thing. Um, so I will be again putting that out next week um, as a Facebook ask. And, you know, again, just um, direct giving, you know, you're not going to get a receipt for it, but that's okay. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, this is, this is also bringing up something else that I think is, um, you know, this is sponsored by the UUA, um, and they don't have a system of tracking religious professionals of color, to my knowledge. Um, it is just sort of word of mouth. You know, I found out about it when I was the community, uh, the development director for the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Um, and even then, it still took me like a year. And I was the director of um, membership and development. And they were like, oh, are you a, re a religious professional of color? I was like, yes, yes, I am. And so, you know, I think um, there's a way in which uh, there are people, we know that, uh, you know, religious professionals of color feel very isolated and disconnected. And so just the the more we can help people feel connected, I think the, the better. We know that's a, a way to help people's resiliency against white supremacy. So I actually, I'll, I'll post in the, the Blue Closed Facebook group because there might be other people I didn't even think to mention it. So I'm really glad you raised that question, Kiana. Um, thank you for that question. Um, even though I know there's a wait list now, we still might be able to make something happen. Um, so I did want to um, back up a little bit to, um, so you had mentioned the um, Whose Faith panel discussion that we had had, um, which was a beautiful discussion where we explored a lot of different things about what it means to be a, a Unitarian Universalist from a Black uh, lens. And it was a powerful discussion. We had really great panelists. Um, it also was sort of the kickoff to our monthly community conversations that we're holding once a month. Um, and we'll be exploring each of the blue principles um, one by one. So, you know, we're, our first one we're starting is going to be with um, Reverend Sophia Betancourt and the second and um, Reverend Bill Sinkfert. And they'll be exploring the all Black Lives Matter, right, which is our first blue principle. Um, and these discussions will take place live in the closed Facebook group. So they are community conversations between Black Unitarian Universalists. We do feel like, however, that the broader UU community would benefit from, from these theological inquiries. So we are going to put them up on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel and then you'll get notifications when they're posted and we'll be posting those. They usually get posted really quickly right after they're done so people can watch them um, and see what kind of rich theological wisdom and insights um, are pulled from those. So really don't miss it. Um, that's that's our first one coming up. Our next one um, is going to be about love, um, self-love and love is expressed in everything that we do, that principle um, that's happening in March. And um, I don't have the dates pulled up with me, um, but if you, if you sign up on our email list on our website, you can get those out. Um, and I'll actually be a part of that discussion uh, along with Reverend Marcus Fogliano um, and also Reverend Lee Kim, uh, Kimberly Hampton uh, will be talking about uh, that. What is there a UU love ethic and what is it? And um, we'll be looking at that. So I'm really looking forward to these discussions. Um, I think that, um, you know, we just, the more we have these discussions, the more we see how much people really want to have them and how needed they are in our faith landscape, especially from a Black perspective. Um, so I think they're just really important. And I, I encourage everyone um, if to, to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you are not Black, so you can 
take a look at them, repost them, share them. Um, and also, you know, if you are black um, or identify as black or African descent, join our close Facebook group so you can take part in the discussions because it's going to be really amazing. And it really expands the faith of Unitarian Universalism and enriches it in the way it's been missing. Um, I think it's been um, stint, stilted, stilted in its growth because it's been so monolithic in its what we amplified, not because there wasn't diversity already there and riches, it just wasn't amplified. Um, and I'm hoping that seminarians, you know, seminar our two seminaries are taking note of decentering what has been centered. And um, so I did want to say that actually seminarians of color are being tracked, have always been, and that's why I think, and ministers of color. Uh, finding Our Way Home is vastly majority ministers and seminarians. And so it's actually all the other professions, both well, educators, musicians, uh, uh, social justice um, prof folks who do the social justice ministries who aren't ordained. So that's also part of our system of who we center and why, uh, you know, we can get into a home. That could be another theological panel. Uh, but I did, I think that's an important part of kind of the, the system and who and how we've amplified. And it, it's no shade to ordain folks. The, the point is that what are we missing when we don't include um, other, not just other, but everyone who is contributing to the ministry of Unitarian Universalism. And that's been what's so inspiring about how Blue um, has fed such a deep need of ministry, care, theology. And the other thing, uh, Lena, can you talk a little bit about Blue Micro 30? I was just on a meeting yesterday that was so inspiring. I would love for you to tell folks what that is. Sure. Um, so Blue Micro 30 um, is really, so, well, let me back up and talk about that. One of our core principles is about experimentation and that we feel like um, trying new things, trying new models is vitally important, both as, you know, a faith, as, as this fusion of faith and organizing, right? Um, and, you know, part of that is that we feel like if we had the solutions, um, we wouldn't even need Blue, we wouldn't even need to be doing this work. So let's be trying something new. So um, we came up with Blue Micro 30 because one of the things, um, feedback, the consistent feedback we get is that people, um, so there's a lot of Black UUs that feel really isolated. You know, they might be the only Black UU at their church or one of a handful, or they might not necessarily be politically aligned with other Black UUs that are at their church. And so, you know, they feel pretty isolated. And anytime you're isolated, you feel like uh, you can feel like there's not a lot you can do, right? So we were, one of the things we try to do with Blue Micro 30 is give people an on-ramp to both how do you organize and mobilize? Um, how, do you, how do we stay connected to the movement for black lives and the broader um, you know, organizing entities that are out there like Mi Gente and other organizations that we're in solidarity with. Um, and so we really created this as sort of an incubator of uh, organizing models. So how can we help people, one, connect to other Black youth who want to do this work, and two, how can we give them the skills to do, you know, organizing? Um, and one of the things we also find out once we, when we first launched this is that people have all these ideas of what organizing is, and they think you need to be organizing rallies of hundreds of thousands of people and like doing all these big things. And that's, you know, that is certainly one tool in a toolbox of hundreds, of probably thousands of things you can do, right? Um, it's just one thing and you never ever have to do that if you don't want to, right? Like there are really profoundly impactful organizers who have never done that in their whole life and have changed the course of this country. So we want to, um, and, and the course of the world, you know, so so really Blue Micro 30, so when we first launched it, um, it was pretty uh, amorphous and it was looser. Um, so one of the things we did this year and bringing the brilliant and amazing Blue organizer Paige Ingram on um, is to reorganize it so that it's broken out by regions. Um, and these are not um, the, uh, the regions of the UUA. So I just want you to get that out of your head. Um, one of the things we did was we really looked at it to say um, how to 
but how can people drive to connect to each other? So we tried to make the regions really tiny so people connect. And um, absolutely, I see that, um, you know, you can, you can go, um, see, I see a comment that you can go to the, our website and learn more about it. And absolutely you can, the Blue Micro 30. Um, so we started these regional teams and we asked folks who would like to be on the regional leads. Um, we also had a group, Team San Kofa that we had put together out of the um, out of the uh, gathering in Mich um, in Detroit that I'm blanking on AMC Allied Media Conference um, and Team Sankofa has been working on different organizing projects so basically um, and I'll just let you all go to the website and read more because there's a lot of details but basically what we're doing is we're going to be doing a babies and bailout project. Um, it's gonna be really beautiful. Each team lead in the region is gonna be helping Team Sankofa to make this project um, alive and make it come together. And you can sign up on our website. Um, and, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be really great. Um, and, you know, I'll also say that this comes out of the OC didn't choose, we didn't choose these topics or issues that Team Sankofa really did. And part of it was looking at what's, what's moving um, nationally in uh, organizing spaces and how can we contribute to those. Um, so that's kind of a long rambling thing, but um, go to the blacklivesuu.com backslash micro 30 and you can learn more about how to become a part of your regional team um, and be a part of supporting that. I should make the, the caveat that this, this is for black folks. Um, so, you know, the blue micro 30 stuff is uh, for black folks. Um, so, and people who identify as African descent. So if that is you, join the blue micro 30 um, and other people you know, certainly can um, contribute and can be a part of it um, in other ways. Um, and part of, um, you know, yes, contributing money, contributing resources, contributing space um, for people to meet, all kinds of ways. Um, so just, just to make that clear for folks. And I just want to add, I am one of the team leads for Blue Micro 30, really. Me really too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And then so a lot of, you talked about, I'm looking at a post from Facebook uh, while we have a, you know, slight pause here. So people did want to hear more about Blue Micro 30, which you've talked about. And um, somebody also wanted you to speak on Thrive. Thrive. You got it. Sure. <laughs> well, we're, we're not actually a part that, that much of Thrive. We certainly support, I, I believe that ministry is now led by um, Reverend Sarah Green, I think. Um, and, you know, we have certainly done workshops with Thrive groups in the past. Um, myself and Dr. Takia Amin in particular, we've done different things. And Leslie, Matt, um, Leslie Mack did a workshop with me too there. So um, Thrive, all I can say is, uh, you know, go look on the UUA website, get in touch with Sarah Green, who is a beautiful, amazing soul and um, find out more information there. But uh, yeah, it's a program offered by the UUA and we don't, yeah. Thrive is for, so there's Thrive Youth and Thrive Young Adult. Thrive Youth is for youth of color, UU youth of color, young adult is uh, for young adults of color. And I believe actually Thrive Youth is um, gonna be in Minneapolis this summer. If I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, shout out. Be, be on the lookout, Lena. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. Yeah. They're coming your way, I'm pretty sure. Because <laughs> my kids were like, hmm, they've already been to Thrive, but they're like, hmm, maybe we should go again. <laughs> they will expect let me just say, if it's in the summer, that Minneapolis is magical in the summer. I'm not kidding you. Everybody comes here and is like, oh, this is so great. I could live here. I'm like, yeah, but wait for the six month winter. But <laughs> summer, three months, two months of summer, awesome. it's magical. It makes yeah. it worth it. So well, that's, they yeah. pick the right time because they'll yeah. definitely be there. I do also just want to mention another way that people can get involved um, that we will have uh, more details coming out probably early next week at this point. But um, we are going to be doing a book study of James Cone, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. 
Um, and we're really excited about that. Um, it's going to be a looking like between six and eight week study. Um, we're hoping to partner um, with Charlene Sinclair, um, who's amazing and studied with um, James Cone when he was still alive at Union Theological Seminary. Um, so, um, and that is going to be um, an uh, invitation to folks who identify as Black and as African descent. Um, and it's going to be really great. So I just uh, really want to just underscore that that's happening and we'll find a way to, to make it so that it's helpful discussion for, for everyone. So yes. And, and I, I see, we, to, yeah. oh, go ahead, Christina. No, you go. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I see Leslie Mack is adding in and underscoring again, as I mentioned that the babies and bailouts actions will have opportunities to ask for all people. So we'll just reiterate that point again. We probably can't reiterate it enough. Yeah, and that's actually along the lines of the point I wanted to make is, you know, as a non-Black POC, um, there are lots of ways for us to participate, model and lead how to support Blue in, activities that center Black Unitarian Universalists. Um, and I think it's really important for us to be able to show up in our lane um, for that support and, and to be able to model it for, for non-Black POC. Um, I think that, um, you know, sometimes there's, in all of our um, experiences, we, we get excited and people, white people get excited about what Blue is doing and like, we want to do that too. And um, I think sometimes on Black PSC are like, yeah, we want to do that too. And it's really important for us to really think about how we can be excited and be supportive and recognize that it is not always our lane and we can still be just as excited about what's going on in Blue and be supportive and you know amplify and provide resource if we're able to do that. Um, but just that there's a, there's a lot of different ways to participate. Thank you for that, Christina. I think I, I would like to take that opportunity to, to touch on one other thing that I feel like is coming up. And it's, it's, it's a question of anti-Blackness within our faith. And it happens from all angles, not just from white folks in our faith, but also from other people of color in our faith. Um, and there is a way in which somehow blue has become sort of, I don't want to say a dirty word, but people have all these like weird approaches to it or they won't say it or, you know, and part of this is coming out of my experience. Um, and, you know, last year at Finding Our Way Home where people would come up to me and say, we really support blue, but they would like whisper it. Like, I'm not kidding you, like whisper it. And not say it publicly. And so I don't have any sort of proclamations for people necessarily about what that means. I mean, I, I certainly have thoughts, but I just want people to interrogate the reasons why they feel like they cannot wholeheartedly, enthusiastically, and publicly support the work of Blue that we're doing. Um, I, I think um, the work, I think it's located in anti-Blackness, right? Um, sort of a lot of the work we are we are doing, it, all of it comes back down to the self-determination for Black folks. Um, and certainly we're in close solidarity with other movements of other marginalized people. Um, and that matters and makes a difference. Um, and it's um, just disheartening to me to see this happening, even when I bring it up in churches. And, you know, people, I'm like, well, are you telling your black congregants about the opportunity of blue to join us, to join the close Facebook group? And people are like, well, no, cause you know, something, something. And I'm like, okay, um, what's this something? And they'll say, well, we don't have information. And I'll say, well, there's a lot of information on our website. You know, we, we know that the website could use a reorganization. We're working on it. Um, and there's still a lot there. There's still a lot there. So, you know, I just want to encourage people to understand that this is sort of a function of anti-Blackness to be afraid of self-determined Black folks, um, to sort of say, you know, certainly there are some Black folks in the faith who say, I don't, I don't politically align with Blue and I don't want to be a part of it. And like, that's perfectly okay. Um, I would encourage folks not to let that be a reason to 
sort of whole wholeheartedly pull their support from blue like how many literally thousands of white you you organizations are there to serve you know the different white folks it's just mind-blowing you know the things that happen so I think that's a part of it um the support piece um and so I just really encourage people to ask that question you know there's this little you know sort of hard knot that people can feel around it um I think it's centered in anti-blackness and I hope that we can start to shift away from that and really start to embrace um you know supporting the self-determination of us as an organization and of us as an entity in Unitarian Universalism um and you know with that I really want to segue into what I think is really good um exciting news that you know as of January 1st blue we took some big strides towards our independence most people don't know, like on the organizational side of things, we are technically a fiscally sponsored project of the UUA. Um, and I will just say, I have been so grateful to um, particularly Tim Brennan at the UUA, um, Mary Catherine Morn when she was still there. Now she's over at the UUSC. Um, but for their uh, support in organizationally helping us build a good foundation from which to start blue, right? Because you could throw money, because a lot of organizations this has happened to, people have been like, here, here's all the money. We're not going to teach you or necessarily support you with the infrastructure to be able to really uh, use that money, super, you know, in, in effective ways. Um, and then people, you know, struggle more. And it's like, you know, that that didn't happen to us because we were really set up in, in a supportive way. So we are making strides towards our independence. Um, we have taken over our payroll. We've taken over our, um, you know, and this is sort of the nerdy administration stuff, but I want folks to see that this is also, um, you know, really part of our experimentation too, because we are still committed to a collective leadership style. Um, we're still committed to doing this, even though we do have, you know, this capitalistic litigious society by which we have to comply. So we're, we're seeing how do we do this um, in, in this hybrid way. Um, and the government shutdown did delay our C3 application. So we now think we're, I called them when they were back open and um, we're supposed to hear by July 20th. Um, if we're on our own two feet or if we're, you know, still got some more work to do. Um, but the strides that we took starting January 1st were, you know, taking over our own payroll, taking over our, you know, our own bank account. These are big deals. I'm in the process now of getting our own accountant, getting all of our reporting together. We just launched the financial transparency group in the fall. That group of individuals is phenomenal. So let me just sing their praises. You can go on our website and figure out who's on there. But let me just tell you that group is a phenomenal, phenomenal group. And um, I just, can't say enough about us taking these steps um, and getting Blue to a really good starting place organizationally. Um, it's in process and um, it's happening. So, and I don't want to lose. Um, Leslie Mack uh, has a couple of comments that are important. Distrust of Black organizing that you haven't had any direct experience with is always rooted in anti Blackness, and many communities of faith are dealing with similar issues of reactions to Black people demanding their own space and self determination. Amen. I've heard the same kind of whispering about Blue, and um, it's unfortunately it's not puzzling, but it's puzzling when it comes, especially from folks that I frankly expect better from and I kind of tell them that I'm like no I don't want to hear it uh if if you know there's this is an important ministry uh to people who just simply have been ignored and so exactly what Leslie said it's self-determination so woohoo Leslie says I want to lift up the blood sweat and tears Lena has done on this part of blue Lena Lena yes, we're Lena. getting you a stash Lena so, and, and Lena as you know from one administrator to another um, it's called Ed Ministry. It is a ministry. It's not, it is not being nerding out. It's oh part of the ministry. So absolutely. Proud Can of I you. Just thank Love you for that. that word. My whole body was like, yes. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And thank you, Leslie, for working that up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we are coming to the top of the hour and um, we don't have uh, folks lined up for next week, but we will have somebody fabulous as always. 
<laughs> and we are excited, so excited and so grateful, Lena, for you coming out and talking with us. And, um, and you know, whenever we, we can have Blue on and, and talk yeah. more about what y'all are doing and um, getting people to really examine uh, their support for Blue, we're here for it. So thank you so much. Amen. For being thank you. We love yeah. you. Yes, thank you for having me. I love you all too. Everybody go hire Kimberly Crenshaw to talk about intersectionality. Please, like and today. I want to give um, a final shout out to our Methodist uh, siblings who this weekend are um, really tackling, not tackling a loose word, really um, coming to grips with what it means to be LGBTQ in their community and our hearts and prayers are with them. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and take care.